Let there be light. Well, welcome to week three of our five-week series called Misquoted, where we are investigating what Scripture says about us and what it says about our faith and what it says about our mission as followers of Jesus in this world. Throughout history, art and faith have overlapped because they speak to the depths of the human experience, and they draw us into the rare and elusive feeling of awe. They are lenses by which we attempt to understand our place in the universe, and across the ages, civilizations regularly regarded the artwork of the divine to be all the created things that we can see. And the people of both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the, the people of Scripture saw the created world as a source of divine revelations. They were looking around themselves and trying to uncover the character of God by trying to identify his fingerprints in all that he's made. And they would create artwork that tried to capture that. And the underlying theme in this series is the importance of context because context shapes how we understand everything in life, including our faith. And in my ongoing attempt to illustrate this, I'd like to uh, have you consider this picture. It's pretty, but pretty unremarkable unless like rural landscapes are like really your thing. At first glance, it appears to be just a winding path through a wheat field with some birds that are flying overhead. I'd like you to take a look at it and form in your mind an opinion about this painting and just kind of hold that opinion in your mind. What do you think of it? Does it mean anything to you? Does it, does it change how you view this picture to know that it was painted by Vincent van Gogh in 1890? That it's worth between 28 and $35 million? And it's considered by many art critics as one of his best works in his career. Some of you are thinking, man, I really do not get art. <laughs> Even still, maybe you can see how the brushstroke work and the technique is similar to his more recognizable Starry Night painting. Take another look at this field, if you would. Does it... Does it change how you view this picture to know that it was one of the very last that Van Gogh painted before he walked out into this very field and shot himself? A lot of critics consider this his suicide note on canvas. Now, of course, art is subjective, and you might still not care for it, but having the context behind the painting changes how you see it, doesn't it? It's no longer just a boring field and some birds. It's an enduring depiction of the mental state of an individual largely considered one of the greatest artists to have ever lived. And context matters. And with that in mind, I would invite you to hear the word of the Lord as it's going to come to us from the New Living Translation in the book of James, in the first chapter, reading verses 2 through 5. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Did you know that before he was a painter, Vincent van Gogh was a pastor? At least he, he tried to be. His father was a Dutch Reformed Calvinist minister, as was his father's father. And the Van Gogh family was also deeply entrenched in the art world. He had two uncles that were art dealers, and his brother Theo also became an art dealer. Vincent began his quest to be in ministry as work, uh, when he went as one of his first jobs working as a Methodist minister's 
assistant. He studied scripture and he fell in love with the gospel and he spent 15 months attempting to pass the entrance exams of the theology department of the University of Amsterdam. And he couldn't do it. And he called it one of the worst times of my life. And having gotten my accreditation, no comment. Van Gogh then pursued being a missionary for two years. He thought, man, if I can't be in the pulpit, then maybe I can be in among the people and I can share God's love in a tangible way by being a missionary. And so he served an impoverished coal mining community in Belgium. And the church had given him appointed lodgings and food and clothing, and he gave it all away. And when they didn't have bandages, he took his bedsheets and made bandages out of his own bedsheets for these people who had nothing. And he slept on straw on the ground among them and loved them deeply. And as a result of his response, many people came to know Jesus. But the parish that that was sponsoring him was embarrassed by his behavior. And they accused him of taking the words of Jesus, get this, too literally. And so they fired him. They terminated his position as a missionary. And Van Gogh was devastated. It turned his world upside down, and he didn't know what to do. And so he turned to the only other world that he knew, which was art. And he actually began painting and sketching as a means of therapy to try to process what it means to want to serve the Lord, but be told you're doing it too intensely, too zealously. And that's all interesting. It's it's interesting to know that this is the genesis of Vincent van Gogh's mental health issues. But what does that have to do with you or this morning's scripture? Well, van Gogh is well known for his problems and for what he produced. And I wonder if we don't also fall into that same trap? Do we attempt to contextualize our lives in that same way? When when you think about your life, when you reflect on your life, is your assessment of it dominated by your problems and by what you produce? I mentioned last week that we can't define ourselves by looking inward, but that doesn't stop us from trying, right? Right? And if you consider yourself to be just the the sum of your problems and what you do, then you've utterly missed the vast expanse of God's grand plan operating all around you. So let me take us up to 30,000 feet and we can look down at the landscape. The temptation for us is to contextualize the world from a perspective that places us at the center And the reality of the matter is that what happens around us and what happens to us is rarely, if ever, entirely about us. We must not embrace a context so myopic that that we suggest that we might be the center of the story that is happening all around us all the time. And this is actually good news. It's like a pressure release valve to realize that you're not the main character, not even in your own story. The world is not on your shoulders. God has a purpose for you. And trusting in him gives meaning to our existence and our circumstances. But we're not simply seeking God's will for our lives. We are reforming our lives for God's will. And the difference comes down to who is in the center. Who is in the center of the action of all that's going on? And spoiler alert, it's not you. It's not you. 
How, how could it be? Do you remember the moment? I remember very clearly when you realized, maybe you watched uh, uh, something on TV or, or news footage from long ago, but that there have been generations upon generations of people who have lived and died before you were even a thought in anybody's mind? That's a wild concept. God is doing something in this world that began way, 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 way before us and will likely exceed our lifespan. But we do get to be a part of it. And a lot of how we're a part of it comes down to how we handle the less than desirable aspects of being alive on earth. And so James writes, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Within the modern secular context, that seems ludicrous. Who, who in their right mind is going to view troubles as an opportunity for joy? And not just joy, but great joy. Troubles, like everything else, are formative. And we discussed the formative nature of all things last week. Troubles either increase or chip away at our faith. And it's all in how we respond to them, which is why James says that our troubles are an opportunity. Now, some Christians over the years have misquoted this passage, meaning that if you're suffering, you should be happy about it. And that's silly. It's silly. James isn't saying... Suck it up and smile through all the trouble and the heartache and the challenges. He's saying that if we handle our difficulties well, then they don't have to be as devastating. We can reframe ourselves as victors and not victims. Because James understands that sometimes we're just too close to the painting to see what's going on. We're just too close to it. And biblical scholar and commentator Douglas Moo, very serious man, very funny name, uh, says this. James reminds his readers that God brings difficulties into believers' lives for a purpose, and that this purpose can be accomplished only if they respond in the right way to their problems. Now, when Moo says that God brings difficulty into our lives, what he means is that God allows us to experience difficulty as opposed to removing us from it. It's not that God is sending you trouble on purpose to see how you'll respond. That's not in the nature or the character of our God. But as we discussed last week, God gives meaning to our troubles. He doesn't always remove us from them. And when we endure difficulty well, we practice relying on God rather than ourselves. And the more that we do that, the closer we're drawn towards holiness. Because the truth is that trials can make us bitter and miserable if we don't handle them the way that God invites us to. They can begin to warp our thinking or make us cynical or suspicious or maybe like Van Gogh, feel like there is no way out of the darkness. The way that God redeems our problems is in training us how to endure them so that they further to form us into the image of Christ. Because if you recall, Jesus Christ knew a lot about suffering. Think about what he suffered to save us. A lot of bad things happened to Jesus. He didn't escape them. He didn't, even though he could, remove himself from those sufferings. He experienced all the same emotions, too, that we do when we go through those things. He wept. And he begged for relief. And he prayed hard. And yet, because he constantly relied on God, he constantly turned to his good Heavenly Father and knew that God was in control, he was able to endure the worst that this world could throw at you. Our, our very highly spiritual culture tends to understand God and religion as therapeutic, meaning that it's ultimately self-serving. The subtext is, I practice religious faith because of what it does for me. 
professor of sociology and director of the Center for the Study of Religion and Society at the University of Notre Dame, Christian Smith, coined the phrase moralistic therapeutic deism to name the prevailing religious belief of younger generations in America. And each of these terms captures a popular but not orthodox belief about God and spirituality. And our faith is often misquoted in the culture by presenting it in this way, moralistic meaning that God wants me to be a good person and don't be a jerk. Okay? Something of an oversimplification, maybe. Therapeutic, meaning that God or religion should help me feel good all the time. That if I have Jesus, then I shouldn't be bothered by what's going on in my life, even when it's really, really hard. Deism, meaning that God is a concept to decorate our lives, but not an agent or, or somebody personal who really does anything in our lives. The primary function of your faith is not to make you feel better. The primary function of your faith is not to make you feel better. And what a shame to be so fixated on what God does for or doesn't do for us that we miss what he's doing among us. That we miss what he's doing in this community of faith. That we miss what he's doing in this city. Troubles are an opportunity to demonstrate God's strength working through us. The same way that Jesus was proved all-powerful by embracing death rather than avoiding it. Our suffering Savior endured the worst that humanity and the supernatural realm could hurl at him, and he emerged victorious. You can read in the, in the book of Acts when Jesus has risen from the dead. He, he appears to his people, and if you are paying attention, he's retained the wounds that he suffered on the cross. Have you ever wondered why that is? And he's been raised from the dead. He's been made perfect, and yet he's still carrying around the scars in his side and in his palms and in his feet. Why would he, why would he do that? He's, he's God, right? He could make it all just go away. Christ transformed his scars into his glory. What was meant to wound him made him infinitely stronger. He turned death blows into testimony, and he wants to do the same in our lives. Now, we might amass some scars along the way in this life, and some of you already have some, and some of them are pretty gnarly. And we know that every scar that we carry carries a story with it, don't we? I want my scars to say, look at what Jesus brought me through, and it didn't kill me. To the glory of God, look at what he's done in my life. Look at what he's brought me through, and I might have been scarred, but it didn't take me down. James continues, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow, so let it grow. James is not advocating the absence of emotion or the misguided notion that, that trials are a litmus test of whether or not you actually have faith. If you have faith at all, any, even a mustard seed, a small monicum of faith, it will be tested. Your faith will be tested. Expect that. Difficulty in life doesn't remove us from God's presence. It doesn't remove us from our troubles. But instead, difficulty in life purifies our faith. Instead of attempting to leverage it like moralistic therapeutic deism, the testing of our faith takes our relationship with Jesus out of the abstract and into deep intimacy. So that every day when you get up and you go about your day, you're walking with the risen Christ, empowered by his Holy Spirit that is within you. That it's not just a belief in your head that you carry around and confess if somebody asks or you have to check a box on a form. 
but the substance of your living is impacted by your relationship with Jesus. Testing purifies our faith by making it less about us so that we can learn to rely on his strength. The kind of strength, by the way, that looked death in the face and said no. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete needing nothing. And if you need wisdom, ask our generous God. He will give it to you, and he will not rebuke you for asking. God is indeed an artist, and his medium is creation, but it is also the stuff of our lives. Through the development of our endurance and the testing of our faith, James says that we're made complete, needing nothing. And trusting the totality of our lives into God's hands gives us the assurance that no matter what terrible things we face, it isn't going to be our undoing. God is going to, in some way, work it to our benefit. And if you are able to maintain that mindset, you become unflappable. Christ transforms us from works in progress into works of art. And if it feels like you are being dragged across the canvas and you're uncertain of what to make of the troubles or the trials that you're facing, James reminds us that if we need some insight, all we have to do is ask. And God is generous and giving, and he doesn't consider your lack of omniscience annoying. On the contrary, he delights in it. He rejoices because it draws you closer to him rather than him having to watch you try to figure it out on your own and stumble and fail and hurt yourself and fall down. He says, come to me if you need clarity, and I will give it to you. Because your life is not the picture. Your life is a brush stroke, and it lasts about as long. However, in the hands of a master, every brush stroke is important to the final product. And masterpieces are composed stroke by stroke over time with great care and consideration. In preparation for this sermon, I went kind of down a rabbit hole on YouTube. Have you ever done that? And I started watching these time-lapse videos that people do of oil paintings. And, And if you have some free time, they're really amazing. I wish that I had time to show you one today. I just, I just don't. But if you watch a talented artist paint something in time lapse, you'll see that at times what is on the canvas looks chaotic and disheveled and meaningless. But by the end, you realize that the smudges become trees when they're given shadows. And the artist shapes out of smears of paint They add color and light by adding stuff that a non-artist like myself would be certain is just going to ruin that painting. But that's the thing. See, I'm not the artist. I don't know what I'm doing. God, on the other hand, is the greatest artist ever. And I think deep down, somehow, somewhere, even amid the darkness, Vincent van Gogh knew that because he wrote this to his brother Theo. Christ alone has affirmed eternal life as the most important certainty, the infinity of time, the futility of death, the necessity and purpose of serenity and devotion. He, speaking of Christ, lived serenely as an artist greater than all other artists, scorning marble and clay and paint and working in the living flesh. In other words, this peerless artist, talking about Christ, scarcely conceivable with the blunt instrument of our modern, nervous, and obtuse brains, made neither statues nor paintings nor books. He maintained in no uncertain terms that he made living men immortals. God is an artist who works in the medium of our lives and what he is creating is art that is alive and art that you are a part of and art that is eternal. And one day when our tribulation has ceased and we are at rest in his presence, we will be able to appreciate the majesty of what he has made. 
adorning the halls of heaven, and you will be able to pick your brushstroke, the brushstroke of your life, and say with great joy, I am a part of this. Look at what God is doing among us. And may it draw you into awe. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you are such a creative artist. That you work the substance and the circumstances of our lives into something that, while we can't comprehend it in the moment because we're too close, is actually something beautiful when we step back. Lord, help us find the beauty in the suffering that we endure, knowing that we can just give that to you, that we can feel the feelings and the emotions that come up, but we can know that it will not be our undoing and that you are with us always and have not left us alone. Help us walk with you. Help us to have the courage to put things in perspective so that we don't constantly feel like we're at the center of everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.